Greetings, Floss Tube. It is Friday, February 9th. February? What? Okay, should I stop the video or should I just leave that in? I'm just going to leave that in because that tells you how stinking tired I am. Plus, this is the third time I've tried to make this video because my mother in law interrupted my last attempt um, on the phone to let me know that my alma mater, James Madison University, who's playing in the um, in the 1AA football playoff quarterfinals against Sam Houston State is going to be on ESPN2 and the game's just starting. I don't fault her in the least bit for the fact that when the phone rang and I was making my video, instead of hitting the pause button, I hit the stop button. Yeah, okay. Well, it's been a long couple weeks, which I'll tell you about at the end of this video. But I thought I would stop by because it's been a while and I have some stitchy box updates to share with you. And I also wanted to do the big reveal on who won the piece of fabric from my Picture This Plus giveaway. And I also wanted to show you a couple of new starts that I have and um, just do a little talking about my trip, which I'll save till the end of the video um, in case you just you know, wanted to see the cross stitch stuff and don't care to listen to that. If you don't want to, that's fine. I understand. Um, not everybody wants to hear people ramble on for hours about stuff that's not related to cross stitch. So that's perfectly, perfectly understandable. But what I was trying to say is it is Friday, December 9th, 2016. It is 7.08 p.m. Um, it's very cold here today in western Massachusetts. It was only supposed to be a high of 32, but with the wind, it didn't feel like it. I mean, it might have gotten to 32, but with the wind, it sounded, it felt like it was like probably like 22. And today I pulled what I call my suit of armor coat out for the first time. It's this big honking goose down filled L.L. Bean coat that goes from, you know, here all the way down to my ankles. And when you wrap up in it and you pull the hood up and get the hood all attached so it's not flopping in your face, you look like a mummy. Or my husband calls it my suit of armor. Because really all you can see is just like a little teensy bit of my face when I'm all bundled up in it. But I'm telling you, you can't be cold in that coat. If you can, you're dead. So it was it was my first suit of armor coat day today. And it was brutal because in my office they had the freaking air conditioning on. And I turned to one of my coworkers at one point and said, Are we really in a Charles Dickens novel? Because hello, the air conditioning is on. And of course I didn't have the kind of coat where I could sit in my coat. Because that coat's too big and poofy and they just look ridiculous. So So I'm digressing. I always do, but I started early this time. So I thought I would show you the contents of the stitchy box. I just threw away the little pieces of paper because I thought I got it filmed before. So I'll just show you what the what the pieces are without reading the little notes that go with them. And the only thing I showed you was the first the first day, which was the um, piece of picture this plus fabric. The second Day two, last Friday, was this beautiful blue spruce wool thread from Gentle Arts. And I didn't know they made wool thread. I've only ever used their hand-dyed their um, hand dyed cotton floss. But this is really, really beautiful. And I could see where this would be good for doing Christmas trees or something that you want to give a little definition to. Um, the note that she included said, yes, you can use wax on this, like if you wanted to use Thread Heaven. But considering I've used Whisper Thread, this should not be hard to use. Trust me, if you can use Whisper Thread, you're doing good. So my day three, um, I believe day three was the little yellow, the gold, red, and green uh, seed beads. I just love beads. I don't love picking them up off the floor like I had to do after... Uh, my ones for my Mill Hill ornament got knocked on the floor over the weekend, but that aside, I love I love beads because they add a certain amount of bling to something and just kind of make it stand out. Actually, I think the beads were day four. I think this was day three. Yeah, this was day three. This was a beautiful piece of burgundy um, 
burgundy lace. Now, it's things like this that make me wish I had access to a sewing machine and really knew how to use one because something like this would be beautiful. Like, I think if you made a Christmas pillow and then you use this to, to trim one of the edges of the pillow or something, but I don't. I don't know. I feel like my finishing techniques are woefully limited because I don't know how to use a sewing machine and don't have one. But then again, I need a sewing machine like I need another hole in my head, which at this point, I'm likely to have another one anyway, but more on that later. But, you know, I'm just saying. And then another piece of the stitchy box, which again makes me wish I had better finishing technique skills than I do. It's this real pretty ribbon. Now I can see myself because I plan next year to make a lot of um, like perforated paper Christmas ornaments. Um, and I can see this being like if you made a big square ornament, you could use this and mount this on the ornament as a hanger. I could see myself using it for that. And to me, that's a very Scandin an old school kind of almost Scandinavian print. And I don't know what it is about this piece of ribbon that makes me think that. It might be the just the color, the, the blue, but that's so pretty. I really like that. I really like that. That's a pretty little ribbon. So then, in yet another finishing technique thing, um, we've got this uh, tart tin. And I have seen where people have made pin cushions out of these where you put like, um, you would like mount your little cross stitch and you would have like some batting fabric in there and make this like a little rounded pillow type thing almost and then glue it in to into the tart tin. But I think if I decide that I'm going to finish this, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this into like an ornament magnet for my refrigerator. Just a thought. I don't know. It might be interesting to see. I know on the um, Christmas, uh, Christmas Advent Box.com, or is it Christmas Countdown Box? Christmas Countdown Box.com, I think, is the website. She gives tips on how to finish one of these as a pin cushion. Um, so that would be fun to play around with, just for some to learn something new, to have a learning curve, you know, a new project to try. I'm always open to trying new things. I just usually don't succeed when I try, but <coughs> anyway. And then um, another part of the stitchy box so far has been Nymo thread. Um, I've been using that on my Mill Hill kits for beading, and it's very strong. It feels like it's a lot stronger than using a DMC thread for beading. So I feel like I trust the Nymo. Hey, that's good reflexes. Trust the Nymo thread more than using a DMC thread. So. Um, yeah, so this will be great for you, the seed beads. And then today's stitchy box, which I have to admit I got all this discombobulated because I thought I was through talking about them. I thought I paused my video instead of turned it off. And then today's was um, some Venetian glass beads, vintage Venetian glass beads from the 1880s to the 1920s was when the company that made these beads did their thing so these are beads are at least almost a hundred years old and I wonder where she found vintage glass Italian beads I mean that's pretty cool right that's why I like these stitchy boxes because this is my first one but I've seen other people do unboxings before and I just like having access to um, oh which reminds me I didn't show you this I like having access to manufacturers and countries, uh, uh, products from countries that I wouldn't necessarily have a chance to experience. Case in point, this really pretty hand-dyed Christmas red thread from the Valdani company. Now it says on this tag, made in Romania. Well, when would I ever have access to Romanian hand-dyed cross-stitch thread unless it was through a, a something like this. So I think if you want to try new fibers and new fabrics and maybe some new finishing techniques, a stitchy box is the way to go. Um, I've already signed up for our next year's stitchy box subscription. It's only $80 for four boxes, which considering, I mean, I'm sure, you know, considering each box is $20 a piece, I mean, this is just already much more than $20 worth of items. 
So, you know, if you want to try some new things and get outside your comfort zone, I would suggest a stitchy box. Um, she's going to, the reason I subscribed was because, first of all, I loved the concept. And second of all, I just wanted to get the 4th of July one. But I thought, well, you know, if you're going to get an advent calendar at Christmas that's basically a stitching advent calendar, and you're going to get the 4th of July, why not get the Valentine's and the Halloween too? So, yeah, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for cross stitch stash. I can't help it. But so far, this box has been really cool. Hopefully, in the next few days, when I come back to do my next video of the stitchy box contents, I will not stop the video instead of pause it. And I will have everything in order by day. And I will have the little slips so I can, you know, let you know what she said about each product. But yeah, I screwed up this video. So. No such luck. You got that all out of order and discombobulated, but hey. It's the kind of week I've had. I'm lucky I can even talk about this stuff. So, oh, and I wanted to tell you, I also tried in my other video to tell you about this shirt. It's a Star Wars related one, of course, but it's a very cool initiative that Target has teamed up with UNICEF to undertake. Uh, the proceeds of these shirts, and they have about five or six. I would have gotten like another two, but why would a grown 42-year-old woman who's not a total dork need three Star Wars shirts? But they're kind of tied into the Rogue One story because there's a couple that say, I'm a rebel. And then there's one that says, go Rogue, which was the other one I wanted, but you know, no need to do that. But they teamed up with UNICEF, and it's an initiative called Force for Fashion. And basically, the proceeds of the sales of these t-shirts um, goes to the UNICEF Fit Kid Band Initiative, which is basically a, like it's like a Fitbit that UNICEF designed, and it's in, to encourage kids to get out and exercise more. And the end result of their exercising is that they log the miles or steps that they've walked, and for a certain number of steps, they get a certain number of points. And these points are translated into nutritional packets for um, children in third world countries. So not only are you encouraging children to get out and exercise more in this country, which is desperately needed, um, but you're also translating that into a reward that these kids can really feel like they're making a difference by just going out and taking a walk with their family, that they've made a difference in the world because their steps and miles that they've walked will translate into these nutritional packets that are sent to third world countries. So I'm not trying to shill for Target or UNICEF or anything. I just think it's really cool when, you know, it's a win-win all the way around. So um, definitely, um, if you're if you're a Star Wars fan, think about getting one of these shirts at Target because it's really comfy. It's a really nice, soft, almost fleecy, fleecy kind of shirt, and you're doing a great benefit for a lot of kids. So enough of that PSA or whatever you want to call it. Um, so one of the pieces. Now, what did I do with it when I? Oh yeah. See, as tired as I am, the, uh, just the phone call just messed with my mind because normally nobody's calling me this time of night but I will go watch the football game in a little bit I just uh, wanted to share this stuff with you and then I came back and my video was not I couldn't unpause it because I stopped it oh, sometimes I swear I am my own worst enemy well so a couple of nights ago I was messing around on the clouds factory um, website and I was just seeing what they had out that was new and I came across this one and I remembered that a few years, a few years, a few months ago, um, I guess it was right around the time that I discovered Clouds Factory and I stitched the Magnum PI one for Bill. Um, he asked me, cause I was telling him, you know, it's, it's a, it's a pattern website that is dedicated to like eighties and nineties TV shows and movies, um, TV characters, that kind of thing. And he said to me, well, do you think, do they have an A-team one? I was like, no, I don't think they have the A-team, but I can always shoot them an email and see if they'll design one. 
So I have no idea how many other people wanted an A-team cross-stitch pattern, but I shot him an email and said, you know, this, the A-team was my husband's favorite. Um, it was my, my husband's favorite TV show when he was a kid. Is there any way you could design a cross-stitch pattern? And then I just forgot about it. So I was on the Clouds Factory website a couple of nights ago, and I found that they do have an A-team pattern now. And here it is. Now, let me see. Of course, you remember, if you watch the show, you remember the black and red conversion band they drove around. Uh, let's see, over here is Howlin' Mad Murdoch. And then there's Hannibal Smith, the leader of the team, George Papard, with his, with his gun. B.A., Mr. T., I'm going to have a lot of fun stitching him because I really, his, his nickname was Bad Attitude. Well, I've been in a really bad attitude at work the past week and a half, so I'll have fun stitching him. And then, of course, Templeton, Templeton Peck, the face man in his little ass guy, because, you know, he always did the really GQ thing, because, I mean, come on, Dirk Benedict, he was a hottie back in the day. I have to admit, Dirk Benedict was the only reason I watched the A-Team as a kid. Um, and then their van. So I'm really thrilled that they actually, you know, I mean, like I said, I don't know. I'm not sure that they designed this just specifically because I asked them for it, but maybe a bunch of Clouds Factory patrons asked for it and they designed it. So I have started it. I started it on my lunch break yesterday. And this is one of the patterns I'm going to take with me on my trip um, because. I didn't want to drag any real big frou frou -y thing with me because, you know, there's just a chance to lose threads or something. I just wanted something simple I could take with me. So I've started it, and I've got part of the 18 written out there. And then that little black triangle right there is Mr. T's mohawk. So that's as much as I've gotten done on that, but I'm going to have fun. And then I'm going to... Um, get that framed for Bill and we'll probably hang it in here somewhere or maybe in the bedroom because we're running out of wall space in the apartment but there's a couple places in here I could hang it for him so that was one of my starts and another one of my starts is already in timeout and I'm not sure I'm gonna have to take it to my framer and ask them if they can because I kinda cut the fabric a little bit way more short than I ever would on purpose but I started it when, on the Monday after we got back from Hawaii and I probably shouldn't have because that was an amateur mistake that I made and I've been stitching for 25 years almost so I probably shouldn't have tried to start something when I was that worn out but at any rate so then on the Monday after we got back I started the um, baby the dragon welcome the baby pattern that I'm going to have ready for next May whenever Miss Cecilia makes her appearance and I am stitching this on the piece of Da Vinci that I showed you before and I got a little bit of it um, you can't really I may take out the little wisp of smoke there coming out of the dragon's nostril because you can't, it doesn't really show up here. And it doesn't really, I may do it with the darker thread. I may take it out and do it with like a 317, like the pewter gray instead of this light one. But I got a little bit of the dragon started. And the dragon that I started is the one that's over the M here. It's this, this dude here. And see how he's got that little smoke coming out of his nostril shaped like a heart? That's not really showing up well, so I may take it out and do it with a darker gray. But all the other co colors are showing up fine. So, um, And yeah, I don't ask me why. I, d I never match my needle binders to my projects or you know use similar themes. But that's the one I bought from Lindy Stitches when she started um, trying to liquidate her... Uh, needle minder stock and it says Han shot first which sums up why I can't stand the digitally remastered Star Wars <sighs> because Han was a 
Han was an asshole. He was a smuggling, he was a pirate, you know? I mean, he was a smuggler. He wasn't supposed to be a nice guy. So you changed it so that Greedo shot first and that's why he killed Greedo? No, 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 no. Han was an asshole in the beginning. Pardon my French. I probably shouldn't swear because I know there are people who take exception to swearing who watch my videos, so I apologize. I will try not to do that anymore. And then the only other real progress I've made since I've been back is I've made a little progress on the memorial stitch that I'm doing in memory of Anne's uh, significant other here, Jim. It's really turning out pretty. I think it's pretty on the gray fabric. The only problem I had with this one was I was stitching on this the night, I guess it was, I guess it was Wednesday night, because um, Bill and I have gotten into watching that Leia Remini takedown of Scientology, and that's on Tuesday nights, and we DVR'd it, and we watched it Wednesday, and I got a little distracted. So I didn't get as much done on this as I wanted to, because I got riveted to the TV show, but, um, yeah, so I did get a little bit done on that. Um, you know, this time of year, I don't always make as much progress as I would like to. Um, I have to say, in Hawaii, I took Leilani. She threw a total tantrum the whole time. I was, like, trying to frog her, and it just didn't work. So she has not come out of timeout since we've been back because I'm still trying to frog. There was just enough of a mistake that I couldn't leave it in or it was going to screw it up a lot further down the road so any progress I made on Leilani is coming out so she spent most of the Hawaii trip in timeout um, and the one that I just showed you I worked on a little bit on the flight to Hawaii um, which was good I mean so um, anyway oh did I announce oh I didn't announce the winner of, of my fabric giveaway um, I just ran the numbers through a number generator before the first attempt at making this video. Uh, there were 21 of you, and I just had my list, and number five came out, and that was Adele. Um, sweetheart, if you, you just shoot me an email, I'll put my email in the description box below, so shoot me an email as soon as you watch this video, and I will put the fabric and the tote bag in the mail to you. Um, I'm not entirely sure how long it's going to take to get a, a box from here to Scotland this time of year. You might get it the first of the year. I don't know. But um, please l send me your information so I can get this in the mail to you. And congratulations. And I'm probably going to do another giveaway because I bought a Rosewood Manor grab bag, pattern grab bag. Um, and I don't even remember. Oh, I think it was just one of those impulse things. Because I I was on the Rosewood Manor site just, you know, because I like to go to the websites and browse. And then browsing always leads to shopping, which always leads to stash enhancement that I didn't need. And the grab bag components are not things that I would stitch. So probably first of the year I will be doing a um, Rosewood Manor pattern giveaway so um, keep your keep a look out for that but I'm not gonna have time to do a giveaway or to do a video about a giveaway until after I get back but that gives us something to look forward to in 2017 right so this would be the time if you don't want to hear me ramble about Hawaii um, to just say good night and I appreciate your support of my stitching and if you're so inclined, I can tell you a lot about Hawaii. Like I said, it was three weeks ago yesterday that we left for the first part of the trip, which was Utah. And we were leaving out of uh, Westfield, uh, which is about 45 minutes southwest of campus. Um, if you're familiar with the Mass Pike, you know that the Mass Pike is I-90, and that actually runs the entire length of the country, east to west. But in Massachusetts, it's the Mass Pike. Um, Westfield is the, fir the first of the very few exits that you get to going west towards New York off the Mass Pike. And there's an air reserve base out there, Barnes. So that Thursday, I worked 7 to 11 came home, got the bags, met Bill at, at the uh, performance center 
you know, we had lunch there. Get on the bus, head to Barnes. Well, either just before or right as we got there, there was a bomb threat. What? I mean, seriously. What the heck? Why would you bomb threat an air reserve base? Don't ask me. But we were about an hour and a half off our target leaving time, so that screwed everything up. Because what was supposed to happen was we were supposed to get to Salt Lake City at 8.30 Mountain Time. And then go from there to Provo, which is about a 45-minute bus ride. And then stop at, a, at Outback on the way there, have dinner. But, of course, that wasn't going to go off. So our ops guys were on the phone with the hotel in Provo. And those people, it, they were golden because they had a steak buffet dinner ready for us when we got there. We got there at like 10.30, I guess we got to Provo. And I was almost too tired to eat, but I hadn't eaten anything since lunch that day. So I had to eat. And it was really good, but I just applaud the, the Marriott for being able to throw that together on a few hours' notice. So that Friday, um, Bill had practice in the, well they did they had a walk through and he wasn't gonna go but he just decided that since I was meeting up with Kay he just let us go do our thing and he'd go to the walk through and um, then he came back to the room and took a, like a two and a half hour nap while we were doing our thing and it was great to get to meet Kay she's every bit as sweet and funny and charming as you would assume she is from her videos and she drove me around the BYU campus which is literally like two minutes up the road from the hotel and you know, she showed me all these places and it was really it was an interesting trip because then we went out to Ogden which is a little over an hour away and she was telling me about all the different places we were passing and the mountains and all that and Utah is a really beautiful place I didn't know that much about it one way or the other because um, I'd never been that far west before the furthest west at that point I had ever been was Arkansas and so, you know, it was really interesting learning about the place and all the different towns and everything. And one thing I found interesting that she told me is that because of the way the mountains are like a ring around the area, that they have weather inversions that cause smog and pollution that can be as bad as Los Angeles on any given day. And she said if you're above a certain elevation, it's like can be 50 degrees and sunny, but if you're down in the bowl in the valley, it can be, you know, 30 degrees and completely overcast. So I found that interesting. But I guess, I mean, the one thing that impressed me was how the heck the settlers got through the mountains. I mean, I know the Mormons settled the area and the Mormons were the ones who settled Utah, but they must have had a lot of intestinal fortitude because if I'd seen those big mountains, I'd have been like, I think I'm going to stay in Colorado. See you later. You know, and I mean, the Donner Party happened there. And, and what she told me about the Donner Party, it was just such a freaking like historical irony that if they had been able to have gone one mile further, there was only like five or six inches of snow one mile further away from where they were and they could have gotten out of it. I mean... Say that that's just my kind of luck. These poor historical people, they have my kind of luck. Because my luck is I'd starve to death and freeze to death and be cannibalized by my own kin a mile away from safety, you know. So yeah, so the Donner Party, I mean I can see why because the like Kay told me, the problem with the Donner Party was they went through at the wrong time of year. You don't go through those mountains in the wintertime, people. I mean, they're like massive huge mountains you'd never get through. So that's what did the Donner Party in, was that they went through at the wrong time. So, you know, we're talking about all that kind of stuff, all kinds of stuff, all the way to Ogden. And Shepherd's Bush is the cutest place. I could live there. And, of course, you know, I came away with a huge stash of stuff. I was like, okay, well, from now through the end of 2017, I'm stitching from stash because... Yeah, I kind of got a few things at Shepherd's Bush, but it was just such a great day. Kay's such a great lady. Um, we got back, and Bill was Bill had taken a nap and gotten some rest, which was good. Um, and then we just had dinner and, you know, called it an early night. So Saturday was the game. Um, oh, we did so poorly. We played just as 
we did the worst we've ever done all season. BYU beat us 51-9. to And the one touchdown we got, we probably shouldn't have gotten just because, I mean... We were playing so sloppy. It was horrible. Now, there was terrible officiating, but, you know, you can't control that. But we just, I don't know what happened. We just, BYU was bigger than us, and they were stronger than us, and much better than us. And we just, anytime we play a team that's any relative amount better than us, we just fold like a house of cards. So I was very disgusted with the way we did but it was funny because the BYU fans were not the ones who ticked me off. They were gracious. I mean, even after the game, we had people coming up and wanting to talk. And I met someone who's from Massachusetts who lives in Utah now. His wife works at uh, BYU. And, um, you know, he was talking about being happy to have had the chance to see UMass play and stuff. And, I mean, before, this, before the game even, everybody was just really nice and sweet. Um... And when we got there, I was trying to take a picture because Lavelle Edwards Stadium, I mean, it's beautiful there. And I had gone across the street to the area where Kay told me that it was like the corporate sponsor tailgates. And I, I had my longer lens on my camera because I screwed up. I didn't take the shorter one with me, too. So I couldn't get far enough away to get the stadium all in the picture. But I did get a decent cell phone picture. But a lady who was over there just started talking to me. And eventually she was like, do you want a tour of the facility? It's like, sure, if, you know, if I'm not creating an issue. And so she had um, a couple of men give me and my husband a tour of the press box and all that. And, you know, and beforehand she was telling me, well, if you want to get a picture of the temple, you need to go on this side of the stadium and go up about halfway in the stands. And if you shoot between the opening in the stadium where the mountain is, you'll see the temple, which actually I saw the Provo temple from the press box. So I didn't have to do that. But she was like, I mean, they were just really, really friendly, super nice people. One of the guys who gave us a tour was a basketball player back in the 60s and, and just really great people. And I mean, you know, I really... I really loved um, the people I met. And the sad thing is, it's not the BYU fans who were being jerks and ticked me off. It was the parent of one of the moms of our players was so awful that I had to get up and leave the game five minutes early. Now, if you know anything about me, we could have like negative nine points on the board and I wouldn't leave until the very end of the game. Um... That's what made the whole quadruple overtime Villanova win back in, uh, I believe it was 2006, excruciating because I refused to go to, I really had to go to the bathroom and I refused to leave the game until somebody won. So I'm the kind of person that I never leave early, but this woman was being so rude and nasty about our coach that it was either say something really nasty and make a fool of myself or get up and leave and I just got up and fortunately the way the BYU stands are I mean they're literally right across from I mean like the stands are here and the, and the visiting locker room is right there so I just came out and went over to where um, I was gonna meet my husband afterwards but this woman her son's not even relevant and she kept saying all these things now granted she didn't know me from Adam I only heard who she was because she introduced herself to another player's parents but she was so awful. And I felt like saying, excuse me, your son's a, a, an irrelevant little shit. Pardon my French again. I don't mean to swear. But your son's an irrelevant little shit. What gives you the right to talk that way about Coach Whipple? And see, the thing to me is like, that would be like hearing somebody say those kind of awful things about my father. So, yeah, I probably had more skin in the game than most people there. But I was so furious, I just had to walk away. Now, the really funny thing, Schadenfreude kicked in big time in Hawaii because her son was one of the kids who got caught smoking pot. So when Bill told me that, I just cracked up laughing. And I was like, well, I guess Ms. Mrs. Hamilton, you know, wouldn't want to know that about her special little snowflake, would she? So, yeah, I mean, I had to laugh about that later. But, um but, yeah, I mean, it was terrible because, you know, you expect to take some level of flack from the opposing team, especially when you're the visiting team going to someone else's house. But the BYU fans were gracious. I mean, 
not rubbing our noses in it. I mean, you could have easily done that because 51 to 9, yeah, our noses probably needed to be rubbed in it. But the BYU fans were really great people, but our own player parents were being jerks. And it just really flew right through me. So, so we went back to the hotel, and I was just really upset. And I saw one of our assistant coach's girlfriends. She's actually from Utah. She's from Logan, and she was there on Thanksgiving break. And she didn't actually make it to the game because um, she was at her sister's debate competition or something. And I was like, well, it's better off that you're not because she will be the future daughter-in-law of the head coach. And I'm like, Thank God you weren't there because you didn't need to hear all that stuff that was being said about coach. And it's funny because she calls him Mark and I'm like, but I can't call him Mark. I think of him like my dad and I could never call my dad by his first name. So, but you know, we talked for a little while and I got everything packed up and then I guess, I don't remember what time we got up Sunday to leave to go to Hawaii, but we flew out of Salt Lake at 930 mountain time. And we got to Hawaii, it was a six hour flight, and we got to, to, to Hawaii around, well, let's see, probably like five o'clock their time, because Hawaii is five hours off of our time here on the East Coast. So, I, but anyway, I mean, it was a six hour flight and we left Salt Lake at 9.30. So when we got there, the athletic director wanted to have a staff get together at this uh, little tiki restaurant in the hotel next to us. So we were all just like, okay, why couldn't you have done this tomorrow? You know, we're not, we're so tired. We don't want to go to a party. But Bill and I went back to the room and um, cleaned up, took showers, and went out to this thing and I ordered a Mai Tai and I had, it was funny because I didn't find this out until after I came back and I was talking to somebody about what it was, but they were putting all these appetizers down and they put down this basket of bread. And of course me, I never met a roll I wouldn't eat, right? So I picked it up and I ate it and it was purple. And I think I posted a picture on my Instagram feed of, well, I don't know why the bread's purple, but it tastes good. Well, it was a taro bread, which is like a Hawaiian version of a potato roll. Um, you know, there's that real yellow doughy roll kind of thing that's like our potato bread, but instead of potatoes, they use taro in it, which is kind of like potato, I guess. It's a starchy root vegetable thing. And I didn't find that out till after we got back and I was talking to someone and they're like, yeah, you had, a, you had taro bread. That's a Hawaiian staple. So, hey, purple bread, it tasted like cake. I didn't care what was in it. Um, and then we had, I tried calamari for the first time, which was actually very good. And I thought it was going to be chewy, which is why I've never tried calamari before. But they said that it came from the belly of the squid and not the tentacles. So it's a much more tender piece of calamari and it was good. And then we had very simple, the best, the best appetizer that we had was, it was pulled pork quesadillas, but it was very simple. It was just strictly pork a little bit of cheese and a quesadilla and it didn't have any, it wasn't slathered with barbecue sauce or anything, just real good. So we went to the party, but by like 7.30, 7.30 that night, I was just hitting the wall because jet lag and alcohol shouldn't mix them. So we went back to the room and went to bed early. And then the next morning I got up early to go, well, I was up at like five because the jet lag, the whole time difference was still messing with me. But it wasn't light enough to go for a walk on the beach until 6.30. So I left around 6, 6.30 to go for a walk. And I told Bill I'd meet him at 7.30 in the hotel dining room for breakfast, but he didn't get to eat because of course they started throwing like 50 million things at him. And he had had to work on the flight from Salt Lake to... Hawaii, I think it took him like two or three hours to get everything finished, get all the, because see, that was the problem with being in Utah and then heading directly for Hawaii, because um, basically, see, Hawaii played Fresno State in at Fresno State, so they were in the same boat we were, except their trip home took longer, it took like two hours longer for them to get back to Hawaii than it did us, and basically, I think what happened was Errol, who's the videographer at BYU, 
got the video from Fresno State and then brought it on a hard drive to Bill at the hotel. And then Bill spent most of the flight on the way to Hawaii working on getting it edited and getting it cut up and getting it um, loaded to everybody's iPads. So, which he said actually made the flight seem like it took less time because he was busy. But anyway, so Monday he didn't even get breakfast and we were going to Pearl Harbor that afternoon. And I was, so I went and got him, made a meat lunch, and then we took a nap and a shower, and then the team went to Pearl Harbor at 2 o'clock. And I have to say, that was the single most tragically sad, yet important thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, especially with this past Wednesday being the 75th anniversary. It was amazing. I cried my way through the whole thing off and on, I'll admit. Um... I think most of what got to me was the fact that when you look at the wall, it was all young kids, you know, private first class, bosun's mates, ensigns, all guys that were like fresh out of boot camp or, you know, who had only been in the military maybe a year. Um, and I think what hit me was that if you think about it that way, the kids who died at Pearl Harbor were not any really much older than the team, you know, 18 to 22 year olds. Maybe a few older kids, but for the most part, they were really young guys who died. Um, you know, of course, there were the commanding officers who got killed, too, but most of the kids who died were about the age of the team, the teammates that I was walking around with. And they told us that, of because, see, if you're, an, if you're a Pearl Harbor survivor in general, you can, be, you can have your ashes interred with the wreckage of the Oklahoma but only Arizona survivors can be buried in the wreckage of the Arizona. So there were seven Arizona survivors alive at the beginning of this year. Two were interred on Wednesday in the Arizona, in the hall of the Arizona. And of the five left, four probably won't make it through to the end of next year. So they'll probably have another four burials next December 7th. So, um, yeah, that, that killed me. I, I couldn't, I just, I started crying even harder when they mentioned that. And the petty officer who was giving us the tour said that he had talked to one of the Navy divers who was in charge of doing the burial at sea type thing. And the guy told him, well, I'm only, I only did it once and I'm never going to do it again. And it was because he took, um, he took one of the urns down. And of course, I mean, they can't cut holes in the ship, so they have to put the urns where there's an opening in the hull already. And he found one. And when he went to put the urn in the hole, the current sucked it in and he said it was almost like the dead were reclaiming their own, you know, their fallen comrade or their comrade was being returned to them. And it freaked him out so bad he never did another interment after that. So yeah, I cried my way through the whole Pearl Harbor thing and we got back and then Bill and I went to the steakhouse that was at the hotel and I have never had a filet mignon so tender that you almost didn't need a knife to cut it, but it was so good. And so then dessert came up and I was like, well, I'm going to do something different. And they had lychee nut and dragon fruit sorbet. I was like, well, I've never had a lychee nut and I've never had dragon fruit. I mean, I know what dragon fruit looks like because I've seen it on cooking channel before, but I've never eaten it. So why not? Well, it was a very different taste than what I was expecting. I was expecting like a fruit. But actually, the lychee nut was the predominant flavor, and it almost tasted like floral. Like, you know, like when you drink a jasmine tea or something, and it's got that flowery taste to it. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't what I was expecting. So then the bartender, because we were eating at the bar, because that was the only seats that were left that you could get a meal right away, gave me a lychee nut, because I guess they put those in some of the cocktails, and it was revolting. It was terrible. I will not ever try another lychee nut again, but the sorbet was okay. But it was just like this rubbery, strange thing. It, it looked like almost like a giant olive, but it had a texture of like, it was chewy. It was rubbery. It was gross. But lychee nut sorbet wasn't that bad, but it did have a, because I was surprised that a nut would taste like a flower, but whatever. It wasn't my favorite Hawaiian thing that I tasted, but. So anyway, Tuesday morning we had a practice and I went with them because at the, see, Bill was only able to take two of his student assistants. 
and he usually needs three students plus himself in any given practice. So I was like, well, you know, I can help if you need me to because years and years ago I used to fill in because back when we were still one double A, he didn't have enough students on the payroll. He didn't have enough budget to pay more than two students. So if a student got sick or a student had finals or something, sometimes I would help him back before I was full-time employed. And so he thought that he was going to need me. Um, but it turned out that they didn't on Tuesday, but they did on Wednesday. But Tuesday night, Tuesday after practice was done, everybody was finished for the day. And we all had the, after, uh, had the afternoon and evening off. So I went and did some shopping while Bill was working. And then... Um, we had a spa treatment because there was a nice spa in the hotel and I was like well I'm gonna get some relaxation into this guy whether he wants it or not so um, we had a massage and it was a 90 minute couples massage and it was um, the best part was actually the part he slept through I felt so bad for him because it was a sugar scrub exfoliating part to the massage and it felt so good I mean, as dry and crazy as my skin is this time of year, it just felt so good. I was like, you know, you could do that all night. That's fine with me. But he slept through that part. So, um, but he, he obviously really needed it because the two days of that had been crazy. And then Wednesday, we had another practice out at the Aloha Bowl, which it's near Pearl Harbor. It's right across the harbor from the memorial. And for a stadium that the NFL uses for the Pro Bowl, it's really kind of old. It's very old school. I mean, I don't know how to describe it, but it's it was probably built in the 60s, and it looks like it was built in the 60s. Um, and I guess maybe I've been spoiled by going to Gillette, and it's a modern facility, but it's very, very old school, which made it cool. But instead of having, like, lights on poles like most stadiums do, they had a bank of lights that went around the top upper deck of where the stadium was and um, wooden stairs up and everything. So I actually was able to help Bill with practice that day. I mean, I didn't shoot but, like, one section of practice, but, you know, it was it was good. Now, the only thing that worried me was he, because it was actually where we filmed from was like a little platform that jutted out from under where the press box was. So when you went in there, you had to actually go down this little ladder to get into the area, which with my fear of heights, it was kind of a bit of a stretch on Tuesday to get used to it. But by Wednesday, I was fine. But going, I think, because it, it rained a little on Wednesday. See, that was the thing about Hawaii. It rained darn near every day we were there. But even if it rained significantly, it was d over and done in like five minutes. So every day we were there, we saw a rainbow at least once because the weather was so variable. But I don't remember if it was when he was coming up out of this out of the press box area or when he was going down into it. But at some point, he slipped and twisted his ankle. So his ankle's been hurting him ever since. And he actually talked to the trainer. He called me earlier tonight and told me he talked to the trainer about his ankle. And he either has a strained or a slightly sprained Achilles tendon. So that's good. He's been walking around on that for two weeks. So I'm, I'm worried about that. So she gave him some stretching exercises to do because she said, you know, by the time he gets to be middle-aged like we are, your Achilles tendon gets a little more fragile so you can tweak it easier. So, Yeah. Just, I don't know. I feel bad for him. Poor man has had more stuff with this leg. And it's the same leg that he had a, a softball-sized hematoma in last year. It's the same leg he severely sprained his ankle on back in 2003. And it's the same leg he broke when he was in high school. So, yeah, I worry about this leg. I, I, I really worry about him having problems with it. So um, she told me to take, like, she told him to take, like, a plastic Solo cup and put it in the freezer and then rub it up and down against his... Achilles tendon later. So yeah, he's had a slightly sprained Achilles tendon since Hawaii. And I, and he did not tell me that his ankle hurt. He told me that his leg was hurting, but he didn't tell me it was his ankle. Because he came back from practice from working on getting practice finished that day and asked me for some aspirin. But I didn't realize it was still hurting him, so I feel terrible about that. So anyway, Wednesday, um, we went out to dinner with a friend of his from 
she used to be at the University of Hawaii as their videographer, but she kind of got let go because they were downsizing to save money. So they basically got rid of her. But she's working for Dragonfly Sports now, which Dragonfly is the software that they use for online internet exchange of film. Um, she works for them now, and she's probably got a better job because she doesn't have the stress of the football season to deal with. But we went to Il Lupino, which was a really good Italian restaurant. Um, I had a really good lobster ravioli. Um, why am I talking so much about the food? Because it was a, a food-based trip, I guess. But um, so anyway, so Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, we were able to sleep in because nothing was going on and we were going to go back over to Pearl Harbor to have um, have Thanksgiving lunch at the Officers Club, which we did. And that was a, oh, was a delicious spread. I mean, they put out the full schlemiel for Thanksgiving, the turkey, the dressing, the cranberry sauce. We ended up eating. We were going to eat with Bill's student employees, but the athletic director walked up and said, is anyone sitting here? What are you supposed to say when the boss of all bosses comes up and says, is anyone sitting here? So we ended up sitting with him. Okay, this time I'm going to hit the pause button, I swear. Yay, I paused it this time. That was Bill getting ready to come home. Fortunately, this is the only weekend he has to work until after the first or second weekend of the year because the dead period starts for recruiting, but he wanted me to know he's on his way home. And our alma mater, James Madison, is kicking the crap out of Sam Houston State, who was previously undefeated, 21 to nothing in the first quarter. Oh, there he is again, because, quite frankly, he told me he couldn't find his keys. I'll be right back. Okay, he found his keys, and he's on his way home, so I'm going to wrap this up. So we, um, Thursday we had Thanksgiving at Pearl Harbor, uh, which was very nice, and Friday was just a simple, you know, there was the walkthrough, but Bill didn't have to go to that. Um, and then, of course, Saturday was the game. Well, Friday, Bill and I spent some time on the beach and doing the last little bits of beach stuff that we could, took a walk on the beach. And it was really cool because we walked out on one of the rock walls and you could actually see all the fish. And it was like looking down into an aquarium, but you, it was actually at the beach. Um... Saturday was the game. The game wasn't until 6 o'clock Saturday night, so I spent Saturday morning packing and making sure everything was ready. And then we left at like 2.30 for the game because the buses, you know, the team has to be there two hours before the game. And we, I guess we left around 3 um, because, you know, we had to get from one side of the island to the other. And so I just put on the clothes that I figured I was going to need to have on um, when we got home, um, I had a long sleeve t-shirt and my jeans on, which actually turned out to be not so bad for Hawaii because it was breezy and it wasn't cold by any means, but it was cool enough I needed long sleeves. So um, the game was at six. We should have won that game. Now, we got hosed at the end of the game. We had, we could have gone up by one in the last less than a minute of the game and won the game, but there was a pass interference penalty that should have been called on Hawaii. I mean, I'm telling you, astronauts on the space station could see that our player was interfered with, but the ref blew the call, and we lost 40 to 46. Well, we should have won 47 to 46, but... So we were all pretty disheartened by that. There was a real scary moment because one of our players um, ended up being taken off the field on a backboard with the neck brace and all. But it turns out he was all right. He, he tweaked his neck. He didn't have a head injury or neck injury or anything. He sprained his neck a little bit, and he had a pinched nerve, which caused some numbness, which the numbness was the reason why they put him on the backboard. Because I was talking to the trainer later, because she was sitting in the row in front of us on the flight back. And I said, I always assume that that's an overabundance of caution. And she said, yeah, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just way overly cautious um, when you see a player taken off on a stretcher or backboard. Um, but he did, she, but she said he was saying he couldn't feel his arm. So we had to do it. And it turned out he got a stinger in his neck, a pinched nerve. Cause he, he had a bit of a sprain in his neck, but he, he met back up with us at the airport and he was fine. Um, you know, they'd just given him some leave, and, you know, I mean, 
mean, as much neck trouble as I have, I can understand how much it hurt him, but at least it wasn't anything terribly serious. So we were all pretty disheartened after the game, and the flight took off at 1 o'clock in the morning Hawaii time, which was like 6 a.m. here. And we flew six out. It was like five and a half hours to Las Vegas. And so we got there at like 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock or something. And, um, well, I guess it was like 7 o'clock. It was, we got there at 7 o'clock Hawaii time, which was like 9 o'clock Vegas time. And we were able to get off the plane. We had like a, a little over an hour at the gate. Um, walk around, stretch our legs, use the bathroom and all. And then the flight from Las Vegas to Westfield was only supposed to be four hours. So that was the shortest leg of the trip. But for some reason, they let us back on the plane. And then they were having trouble with the refueling of the plane because they basically, the pilot, I'm not sure what was going on. I think they didn't have gas trucks big enough to hold all the fuel we needed. So they had to get another gas truck after they pretty much emptied the first one. But the pilot came on and said that we, since we had to do another equivalent, of, well, I mean, this was a cross-country flight, but we had already done the equivalent of one cross-country flight because it was basically 3,000 miles to Vegas. Well, we needed 20,000 gallons of fuel, so it was going to take a while to get refueled. And I guess it's because they didn't have, which makes no sense to me, because McCarran International is an international airport, so you can't tell me they don't have 757s fly in there from across the country. You know, like say somebody from Connecticut flew from Hartford to Las Vegas on vacation like we did one time. But at any rate, that was what they said. So we sat on the plane for over an hour before we took off. But by the time we got home, we were all just worn out. And so um, Monday I took the day off and I spent the day stitching. And it was, you know, I mean, I was fine. I was over the jet lag by like Tuesday, but it was just tiring. And when I got back to work, it was the same old BS I left. I Tuesday afternoon I was talking to one of my friends about the trip and it inadvertently got her in trouble because one of her little snotty cube mates complained about how just how much of a distraction she was. And I felt terrible because I felt like, well, you weren't talking to yourself. You know, I was talking to you. So I felt terrible that I got her in trouble. And I mean, just ugh, stupid crap like that. So the past two weeks, yesterday I had my little half day thing and Bill and I went to acupuncture and I ended up having a gua sha treatment for my neck, which... It sounds really esoteric, but it actually does help. It's it, the it, that she puts like this ointment on my shoulder and then scrapes it off with this porcelain spoon. And it's supposed to like bring blood flow to the surface to like, you know, because a lot of pain is caused by constricted blood vessels and like when they get real tight and everything. So if you can dilate the blood vessels and get more blood flow, you can help with pain relief. So I did that yesterday, and I I feel crappy today, but tomorrow I know I'll feel a lot better because it usually takes about 24 hours for that to really kick in and really help you feel better. But anyway, so I better go. This video is almost an hour long as it is, and y'all have heard me run my trap long enough, I'm sure. Um, but I just wanted to say hello. Adele, please do uh, send me your contact info, and... I'm not sure when I'll be back. It might be mid to late next week before I get back. Um, but and thank you for listening. Um, thank you to menu subscribers. I think I'm at 300 now. So that's great. I hope to still find the, you know, I have a few new subscribers here and there. It is very flattering to think that you want to listen to what I have to say. And I appreciate the support. It keeps me going. And it just until next time, I wish you happy stitching and a happy life, and I promise I'll be more coherent next time I come back. Bye.